Let's go on with part 5. Grigor was involved in an accident and since then he can't feel hurt even if you cut him and cannot feel if he's standing or lying. What part of his senses was affected? So there was a typing error. Vision, audition, gestation, of action. Now talking about these senses, of course we know humans have got five senses. Now depending with what is going to be affected in that case, it is going to affect how we are going to be able to to work. So if we consider first, what are the senses that we do have? We have got vision to be able to see. We have got audition to be able to hear, gestation to be able to taste, of action to be able to smell, and the somato sense to be able to feel pain, temperature, pressure. We have also additional senses, the kinesthesia, to feel when we are in motion, when, when we are moving ourselves. And the vestibular sense, that is a sense of balance. When, for example, you are in a vehicle, the vehicle is moving, you can feel if it is accelerating, if it has decreased, or if you are moving in a circle. So those are the senses that we do have. So in this case, a somato sensation was affected. Next question. Even though Joseph closes his eyes, he knows when his right hand is in front of his left one. This is called... Kinesthesia sense, vestibular sense, proprioception sense, somato sensation. So when you're talking about these sensations again, we, when we mention the kinesthesia sense and the vestibular sense, kinesthesia has to do with us moving our bodies. Vestibular sense has to do with us feeling that we are really moving if you are, let's say, in a vehicle. Now, we have kinesthesia and proprioception. The first one, kinesthesia, has to do with us moving the entire body. So you are able to feel that you are going in front, even if you close your eyes, or you are going behind. But proprioception has to do with you just feeling that one part of your limb is in front of the other. For example, you can feel that my right hand is in front of my left so even when you are walking, you can feel that this hand is in front of the left or of this other one. And that will also enable you to, when you are eating, even if it's dark, you can feel that this hand is on top and it is going towards my mouth like that. So the answer here is going to be proprioception as the sense that is going to enable us to be able to, to know when the right hand is in front of the other one. Catherine is a student doctor coming from class in the evening. On her way, she meets two guys who start following her behind. She quickly turns out of the lights and begins to run. Even though it's dark and can't see, she knows that she is moving forward. What kind of sense helped her in this scenario? Kinesthesia, vestibular, appropriation, or proprioception, and then the sense of feeling. So this is now kinesthesia. She is moving forward and she does know that she is moving forward even if it's dark. The perception process involves the following processes except selection, organization, compiling, interpretation. So the perception process is going to involve selection, organization, and interpretation. So compiling is not part of that. So you are going to select what you want to perceive and then you are going to organize that and then you get to interpret. Next one, dash is the process through which we attend to some stimuli in our environment and not others. Selection, organization, compiling, interpretation. So that is called selection. We get to choose what we want to listen to or what we really want to pay attention to and not others. Pamela is in class and music is playing loudly in the adjacent hall. Her classmates are also talking loudly behind her, but she is still paying attention to the lecturer as though there is no background noise. This is known as falling in love, prioritizing, cocktail party effect, minding on business. So that is referred to as the cocktail party effect. Even if you have got a rot, of noise around, you're still paying attention to what you have really selected to listen to. 
The following are factors that affect selection of motivation, except following are factors that affect selection of motivation, except the influence of motive like long-term drive, like anger, cocktail party effect, the influence of stimulus intensity, long-term motivation like medicine. So long-term motivations do, motivations actually are going to be able to affect the way we get to select what we want to pay attention to. For example, when you choose your career, it is a long-term motivation. So D is correct. The influence, of stim, uh, the influence of stimulus intensity is also correct. It also affects the way we get to select information. For example, you are in class, the lecturer is explaining, and then someone just enters and the phone rings loudly. So you all turn and look at that person. That is the intensity of the stimulus. The cocktail party effect also uh, affects selection. You pay attention to what you want to pay attention to. Now, A, the influence of motives like long-term drive. Hunger is not a long-term drive. It is a short-term drive. Immediately, you get angry, you want to eat something, so it is affecting your selection. So, th the reason as to why that one is wrong because of anger. If there was maybe a career there, it is a long-term drive, would have said it's correct. So, the answer is A. Dash is the capability of our brain to generate war forms, particularly with respect to the visual recognition of global figures, instead of just collections of simpler and unrelated elements as below. So we can see we have got this picture. What the brain is going to do is that the brain is going to complete this for us to say there is a rectangle inside and then we have got these which are outside actually there's no triangle inside it's just same circles which have been actually just some circles where a quarter has been cut which have been put next to each other but our brain interprets that we have got a rectangle inside so what do we call that grouping guest gestalt effect schema effect intelligence theory so that is called the guess that effect, where the brain gets to generate war forms just to help us to complete things for us. The next one. Dash is the tendency of animals and humans to see familiar objects as having standard shape, size, color, or location, regardless of changes in the angle of perspective, distance, or lighting. Perceptual constants, object constants, constant phenomenon, or. Oh. So the tendency of animals and humans to see familiar objects as having standard either shape, color, location, and everything that is all of these. Perceptual constants or objects constants or constant phenomenon is the same term. So the answer is all of the above. For example, when you are let's say you are in your room you know that this cup let's say maybe it is red even if you take it in the dark you are going to still perceive it as red even if it is necessarily not looking reddish or even if there is a change or for example you are looking at something and then there is a shadow for example, you are standing and then there is a shadow that is covering, let's say, the bucket. Even if you know that this bucket is green, but there is a shadow there, the shadow might change slightly the color of that bucket, but you still perceive it as being green because the brain wants to always maintain familiar objects as having a standard color like that. In the dash phenomenon, it appears that the unlit section is moving around the circle rather than a series of bulbs going out one at a time. So you see that, for example, maybe you have got bulbs. It appears as though when, okay, they are light, they are changing colors like that, as though they are moving. I don't know if you have ever noticed that. You look at some bulbs, it appears as though they are moving 
So what is actually happening is that one bulb here lights, another gets off, another lights, another gets off like that. But it appears as though light is moving like that. So that is called the phi phenomenon. I would have shown a picture where something like that is, is present. You are passing in the road and you hear two boys arguing. One is saying a person can learn something even if they are really not concerned or not thinking about it. While another says you can only learn if you consciously put in effort. From your knowledge of learning as a medical student, learning can only happen consciously, only happen unconsciously, can happen both consciously or unconsciously, only happen for intelligent people. So learning can actually happen unconsciously or consciously. Sometimes when you are passing, you hear people talking. You might you might just get to, you are not really interested in listening to what they are saying. But as you go maybe to where you are going, or maybe you, you were just passing and then heard the song. You didn't pay attention. You didn't put it in you. But as you go, you start remembering, maybe even trying to recall and sing that song. So you learned unconsciously. Emily is a patient who has just arrived at UTH for the first time. The noise from the environment and people crying really irritated her. As days went by, she could no longer hear the noise. This is known as habituation, sensitization, classical condition, operant condition. What would you pick for that one? So that is called habituation. Something becomes an habit, even if it was irritating at the beginning. Next question. Sarah and John have been together for several years, and initially they both responded to each other's, other's needs and emotions in a caring and supportive manner. However, over time, due to various stresses and conflicts, when John expresses frustration about something unrelated to their relationship, Sarah reacts more strongly than she did in the early stages of their relationship. This is called habituation, sensitization, classical conditioning, operant conditioning. So that is called sensitization. You can see at the beginning, they used to communicate very well. They never used to more get upset with each other. But as time goes by, they both learn and get to adopt such that if one is hating you, you answer them back. So that is sensitization. Just to get to mention some things on, on this topic, learning. So there are different theories of learning. Habituation is also called desensitization. When you have got a repeated stimulation, it's going to result in a decreased response. Like the example that we gave you, been getting you go to an office where there is very much noise, but the more you stay there, the more you stop hearing the noise, such that the next time you go, if you find that noise is not there, it will even be irritating because you are used to that noise. So that is habituation or desensitization. Sensitization is when you have got a repeated stimulus, it is going to result in an increased response. Repeated stimulus, increased response. So you never used to argue, but the more you argue, the more you start answering to each other much and much. So that is sensitization. There is also associative learning in which there is a connection or association between two events. For example, every time you hear a port, you should think of unshima or you should, should think about food. That is associative learning, which can be either classical or apparent, apparent. And then classical conditioning can also be divided, of course. Now, all those, we can talk about them. Let us, we get to answer these different questions that we have. So we can now proceed. 1015 Dash was developed by an American psychologist called Bahas Frederick Skinner. Habituation, sensitization, classical conditioning, operant conditioning. 
or condition? Which one would you pick? So it was the operant condition. It was developed by Bahas Frederick Skinner. The classical condition, this was more talked about by the man who did an experiment with a dog, where every time he used to go to the dog to take the food, he used to use a bell, such that every time he's taking food, he's going with a bell. That was what uh, the experiment which was done. And the dog started learning to say, every time I hear the bell, I should think about food, such that even if the food is not there, the dog could uh, saliva it. So now, let's just talk about it a bit, and then we are going to be able to answer the questions because they are going to be more similar. So there is con classical conditioning. So we talked about different theories of learning. There is also, apart from de sensitization, desensitization, there is associative learning where you get to associate different things. So associative learning can be split into two classical conditioning and operant conditioning. When we talk about conditioning, condition is just a process of learning associations, learning two different and related things being related. So when we talk about classical conditioning, elements here of classical conditioning, you have got unconditional response, unconditional. So if we hear something, unconditional response, this is a natural occurring behavior that does not have to be learned. When you talk about response, it is what you are giving back. For example, every time you get the smell of food, you are going to salive it. So that is the unconditional response. That is a response you give without you learning. It is natural. So these are some of the elements of classical conditioning. Also, unconditioned stimulus or stimuli. So unconditioned stimuli is anything that can cause you to respond without you learning. It is just natural. For example, the smell of food, or if you hear a very big noise, you are going to turn and look there. That is unconditioned stimulus. You turning to look there is unconditioned response. You didn't learn to do that. There is also conditioned response. Uh, this now is a learned response. You, there was a neutral stimuli, but you get to learn. For example, every time you hear a bell, because maybe you came from a boarding school, if you hear a bell, you should think of food. So every time you hear a bell, you start salivating because you are thinking about food. That is a conditioned response. It doesn't mean that a bell means food. A bell can also mean maybe break time, knocking off time. But because you learned that, so that is a conditioned response. What is the response? You salivating when you hear the bell. What is the conditioned stimuli? The bell is a conditioned stimuli. Why is it conditioned stimuli? It causes a response because you have learned that if I hear the bell, I should think about food. So this theory was done based by Ivan Pavlov, who worked with a dog. Now we also have the other one, which is apart from the classical conditioning, we also have the up operant conditioning, the same one which was developed by Frederick Skinner. In here, it is a form of learning in which the consequences of the behavior produce changes in the possibility of behavior. If you know that this thing is going to be painful, you want to stop that because you know it is painful. So according to Skinner, he said behavior is actually determined by consequences. For example, there is positive reinforcement, which is also called reward. When you introduce a positive stimulus, that is going to result in an increase in the rate of behavior. For example, if someone, if you send someone, they go, you give them money they are going to be encouraged to do that more. That is positive reinforcement or reward. There is also negative reinforcement. Now, negative reinforcement is the removal of an aversive stimulus. If you hear the word aversive stimulus, it just tells us of something that is hateful. So if you remove something that is painful, it is going to increase behavior. For example, if you remove punishment, if someone is late, 
it might increase that behavior. Now, this one, you are mostly talking about it in a positive way. The removal of something bad, that is going to result in an increase of the rate of behavior. Now, anyway, the behavior can also be negative or positive. So you say, we are going to, even if you come at 18 hours, we will not do anything to you. That is negative reinforcement. You have removed something, but that is going to increase behavior. It is different from punishment. Negative reinforcement is also called escape or avoidance. It is not punishment. Punishment is you introducing an aversive stimulus, something that is painful so that you reduce behavior. So they're actually opposites of each other. Okay. Now, what happens is that when you get to expose people more to to something, for example, when you are giving a dog food with a bell every time, and then every time you ring a bell, the dog comes, every time you ring the bell, the dog comes. When you stop giving them food after the bell rings, they will start knowing to say they've stopped giving me food, even if the bell rings. So that stimulus will stop generating a response in that, in that dog. So that is called extinction. And we have also a reinforcer. A reinforcer is any stimulus or any event that strengthens or increases the frequency of behavior. For example, you are given money every time you obey. That is, money is a reinforcer. So again, so others are going to consider them as we get to answer these questions. Now, one skistin, a form of learning in which the consequences of the behavior produce changes in the possibility of the behavior's occurrences. Form of learning in which the consequences of the behavior produce changes in the possibility. Operant condition, smooth learning, habit, habituation, active learning. So we have talked about this, that is the operant learning. 117, every time James's mother came home, she brought sweets for him. This made little James to open their mouth every time he saw his mother in anticipation that there would be sweets. This phenomenon was developed by this phenomenon was developed by Ivan Pavlov, Bahas Frederick, Gregory Schema. So this phenomenon was developed by Ivan Pavlov. It is similar to the experiment which was done. This is classical conditioning which was done on the dog. Every time you see something, you relate it to something that you are interested in. Of course, the mother has no relationship with sweets, but it's just that every time the mother came, sweets also came. Initial learning of the stimulus response where the conditioned response is learned like salivation in response to by the bell is known as Initial learning of the stimulus response where the conditioned response is learned like salivation in response to the bell is known as acquisition, generalization, extinction, discrimination. What would you pick? So this is known as acquisition. Again, when we are talking about learning, we can just get to speak about this, some of these terms. When you are talking about learning, the initial time, the initial, when you are learning an, a conditioned response. Now, conditioned response is not something that you, you are born with. It's not something that is natural. You have to learn. Okay. So you have to learn a certain behavior. That is called acquisition. So those are some of the features of classical conditioning. Remember, class conditioning, you are learning something. So, for example, you get to learn to respond to a conditioned response, that is acquisition. And then generalization is the tendency of a new stimulus that is similar to the original uh, condition stimulus to elicit a response that is similar to the conditioned response. For example, you have learned to say, if I hear a bell, I should salive it. Even if you go to a church, you hear a bell ringing, you start salivating because you are used to a bell being related to food. It's not the actual bell that you learned from, but it is similar to the bell that you hear. There is also extinction. We talked about it where there is a decrease in response because 
you no longer pair the stimulus with uh, what I am responding to. Okay, maybe you have stopped bringing food, but the bell is ringing. So as time goes on, every time I hear the bell and there's no food, that, that will go into extinction. I'll stop salivating because I'm, I'm now stopping to relate those two. There is also discrimination, a process in which you respond to certain stimulus and not to respond to others. For example, you can respond to a bell and not respond, let's say, maybe to pots making noise. That is discrimination, right? So now we can proceed and answer the others. Every time, I think we answered this, okay. Every time James sees a woman with a bag, he thinks they are sweets because a mother's bag always contains sweets. This is called acquisition, generalization, extinction, discrimination. So this is called generalization. When James noticed that a mother's bag no longer contains sweets, he stopped running to her gradually. This is called, so that is called extinction. Dash was developed by Joseph Hoop for the treatment of phobias. Systematic desensitization conditioned response, Pavlov's experiment, medicine. So what was developed by Joseph Hoop for, as a treatment of phobias is the systematic desensitization. So this is similar in, uh, to just, of course, the way desensitization itself is telling us. It's similar to extinction. Now, how does this work, the systematic desensitization? So when you have been exposed to your fears a lot of times, you get used to those fears such that they become more like something that is common. So that is systematic desensitization, a gradual exposure to the subject of, a, of something that you fear. At the end, you get to be familiar with it. For example, when you are afraid of a dog, every time today, maybe you touch the air of the dog, you touch tomorrow the air of the dog, you get used and you stop fearing that. And that is actually able to be used in treatment of phobia. You no longer be afraid of dogs. Gradual exposure to your fears can gradually treat some of your fears and emotional problems. True or false? So this is true. 123. John is a 35-year-old man who has been struggling with alcohol addiction for several years. He wanted to quit drinking as it has severely impacted his personal and professional life. Johnny seeks help from a licensed ther therapist who, during the therapy sessions, gives John Dysalfiran and asks him to drink alcohol. Since Dysalfiran causes severe discomfort when combined with alcohol, John experiences symptoms like nausea, vomiting, headache, and rapid heart rate. With time, John uh, starts avoiding taking the alcohol because of the results. What treatment did the therapist give? Flooding, fear-based, aversion, none of these. So this is called aversion. So this is an aversion therapy where you get to use something together with an act so that someone can stop that act. That is aversion. Now, also of the term flooding, the what does flooding mean? So flooding is also based on the principle of desensitization. To say when you present a feared stimulus for sufficient long period of time, provided the subject can tolerate the anxiety. So this one is desensitization. Okay, you are more getting familiar with something and not stopping. For the aversion therapy, they are easy, stopping. So you pair and present or painful stimulus with the target behavior so that someone can stop that behavior. That is the aversion therapy. Behavior is determined by its consequences, true or false? So this is true, just like here we can see John stops drinking alcohol. That was the behavior. 
but because he knows the consequences when he drinks is relating to the what he has been given it is always causing nausea vomiting and all this so he gets to stop that so here is where we're going to end and the next one will proceed with part six